Hi all, you're very welcome this afternoon. We're just going to give it one minute until our other participants join us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our second webinar in our autumn webinar series on building sustainable communities, national and international perspectives. My name is Aoife Corcoran, and I'm the sustainability advisor here at the Housing Agency. I'm joined today by my colleague, Michael Mihail, who's running the back end of the webinar, and by our speaker, Scott Mackey from mid Steeple Quarter. Before we start, I'd like to draw your attention to a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, we have a questions and answers button at the bottom of your screens. If you have any questions for Scott, we would ask you that you use the Q&A function. If you just want to make comments, please just add them to the chat. Finally, just be aware that this session is being recorded and will be made available on the Housing Agency YouTube channel. The slides will also be made available on request. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. I'll give you a very short introduction to the Housing Agency and the Autumn webinar series. Scott will then present his work on community-led town centre regeneration at mid Steeple Quarter in Dumfries in Scotland. We'll then have a Q&A session where we would encourage you to participate and ask any relevant questions you may have. If we can't answer your questions as part of the webinar today, we'll make every effort to answer them at a later stage. We aim to keep today's webinar to a maximum of 50 minutes. The Housing Agency, which is hosting this series, is a state agency based on Upper Mount Street here in Dublin. The Housing Agency works with and supports local authorities, approved housing bodies, the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage and the private sector in the delivery of housing and housing services. Our vision is to enable everyone to live in good quality, affordable homes in sustainable communities. It's the Housing Agency's vision for achieving sustainable communities and our recognition that the provision of housing in Ireland must be aligned with national and international climate and sustainability agreements, which has inspired this series. The aim of the Autumn webinar series is to contribute to and stimulate a discussion on sustainability topics which are relevant for housing in Ireland. To raise awareness of the importance of building resilient and sustainable communities in the light of local, national and global shocks to the system and to create opportunities for collaboration and future projects. This webinar series explores four topics which are relevant for housing, financing the future of housing, which we spoke about last week, mobility, walkability and neighborhood design, sustainable building certificate, certification, and today's webinar, which is people power, community-led town center regeneration in Dumfries in Scotland. On that note, I would like to introduce you today to Scott Mackey from the, the manager of Mid Steeple Quarter. Scott Mackey has a background in town planning, building and community development, and is a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute with expertise in commercial development planning across the UK for clients such as property investment funds and major commercial developers in retail, residential and leisure. He's a planning consultant in private practice and also the manager of Mid Steeple Quarter leading a small project team to deliver this local community's vision. Scott, the floor is yours. Hello everybody uh, from Dumfries. I'm in, from calling you from Dumfries in Southwest Scotland here. As, uh, as Aoife says, I'm managed Dumfries High Street Limited, which trades as a mid steeple quarter Dumfries. And mid steeple quarter is a, is a pioneering community-led initiative. It's regarded as the UK's first community-owned high street redevelopment project. Let me just uh, share my slides with you. So, 
So Bid Staple uh, Quarter it involves, it's a project really that involves the local community taking control of underused and neglected high street buildings in the, in the town centre. And the idea being to refurbish and redevelop these as a contemporary living, working, socialising, learning and enterprising quarter. And we're aiming to, to just breathe new life into the high street by facilitating diversity and creating a catalyst for a more thriving and resilient town centre for the town. We've constituted ourselves as a community benefit society. Now, Dumfries is a, a, a town, it's a rural market town of a population of about 40,000 people, which historically has been the main market town and administrative centre for the region of Dumfries and Galloway. However, in recent years, it's become a market town with no market, which is a bit like a coal town having lost its pit. And like many high streets up and down the country, we've seen the market failure of retail as the main use in our high street. And this failure has negatively affected the vitality and viability of the town centre. And it sends out a negative message to local businesses and residents. It impacts upon the confidence, uh, economic confidence and social optimism. And it gives a negative message to visitors and that's potential investors or tourists. But what does market failure look like? Well, the public sector has really been unable to adequately respond to the regeneration and the regeneration strategies that have been tried have been very slow to catch up. And over the last couple of decades, the private sector funding has not been attracted to the town centre. And the feast now has one of the lowest levels of residential living of any high street in Scotland. There has been um, obvious negative impacts on the town centre through empty shops, declining and derelict buildings. And the focus for owners of high street properties has been just on ground floor rental for retail to the detriment of upper floors, with most upper floors being derelict. Um, they've been em left empty, unmaintained, and are now many of them no longer fit for, for any purpose. And in some buildings, these stairways have even been and to the ground floor have even been removed, so there isn't actually access to the upper floors anymore. This has been done in order to maximise the ground floor retail floor space. So a possible solution to this problem um, really centres around places, community and power. So in terms of the places, the places need to be welcoming and inclusive and they need to support local people to be enterprising, to grow local prosperity and well-being for the whole community. And places need to be a space to celebrate, to protest and to remember places that are woven into the, the fabric and the creation of a culture of, of the town that reflects its people. So the question is, how do you make and sustain such places? And more specifically, how can communities themselves do this when the world that they've inherited has placed power and resources out with uh, the community's control? So this specific relationship between communities and power can differ from place to place, but the sense and impact of this disconnect, I think, is, is universal. So the community in Dumfries uh, focused around uh, the, what we call the Stove Network, which is a, a, an artist-based civic community centre. And uh, they, that, the Stove used creativity as a tool to actively involve the community in reshaping the future of the town. So. We're based in the middle of the high street, the stove, and the stove incorporates a ground floor cafe, an outdoor area, first floor exhibition space and second floor workspace. And it's become a kind of engine of creativity in Dumfries. But the stove is much more than just this building. And, and, and in 2011, the stove network worked primarily in the arts sector through social enterprise principles. But since 2016 is now recognised as a community benefit trust for Dumfries Town Centre. We create mid depot quarter. Well, in 2016, in March, the stove uh, initiated what they called Square Goal, which was really the starting point to identify themes derived from the public's views on what they would like the future of the town centre to be. And this event uh, attracted over 500 people over two days and was followed by further consultations throughout uh, sort of the end of 2016 and early 2017. Seven themes emerged from this consultation, and the key one was about town centre living, about getting people to move back into the town centre, which would mean more activity in the centre, economic vibrancy, and more activity also in the evenings. 
and the mission kind of focused on uh, on partners coming together to do something that everybody kind of believed in, everybody got behind. So making a mixed town centre that benefited local people through localised economics to build community ownership. And the key driver for the mission was really, as I said, bringing people back to live in the town centre. For placemaking to be effective in regeneration, it's got to incorporate inclusion, health and wellbeing and community empowerment. And it can do this by people having a voice in local decision making and growing distinctiveness for places and developing skills and new creative businesses and social enterprises. Um, community led planning is at the heart of this. So we, we sought to empower people to have that voice in local decision making to initiate the partnership projects from the community. We uh, we started what we called the Duntun Army, which was really a, an expression of a protest movement, um, kind of raising the purpose being to raise community awareness, um, and as a as a kind of basis for our community consultation processes, to involve the community as much as possible to uh, work with other stakeholders, local officials, and politicians. From the council and Scottish government, and the creatives at the social uh, at the Stoke Network uh, helped to create interest and profile by emulating this protest movement, and created a local action group called the Duntun Army, which organised clean up days and market stalls, selling T-shirts and badges to support um, this extensive social media campaign, which we started, all to raise the awareness, profile, and create a buzz about the project. And we asked a simple question, who does the high street belong to? Um, community cleanup days were organised. We gathered volunteers into the project through that. We built capacity and we engendered a pride in the town centre to grow a movement of people feeling that they could make a difference. And we created a new delivery vehicle. So on the back of all that consultation and activism in 2017, a partnership project was initiated looking at the major redevelopment of a key location in the High Street, which we've called the Mid Steeple Quarter, which has resulted in a memorandum of understanding with the University of West of Scotland, NHS Dumfries and Galloway, the local housing association, support from Scottish Government and Dumfries and Galloway Council. And the Mid Steeple Quarter project evolved from a consensus among the local people, businesses, groups and agencies to get behind the idea of a more diverse town centre as a priority. And Miserable Quarter is now constituted as a community benefit society in its own right. And this community benefit society is now registered as Dumfries High Street Limited, but trades as Miserable Quarter. We have over 400 members who have voting membership of uh, Dumfries High Street Limited, which is aligned to the postcodes covering the town. And associate membership is also available uh, for people who live outside the town. The members annually elect a board to direct the project and employ a project team for the day to day delivery. So the vision of Miss April Quarter really is about, uh, it came out of the consultation which emerged uh, that um, uh, this uh, town centre, what the town centre should become. How do we achieve that more vibrant and open high street economy where the market has failed? The current economies of the town centre presents this unique opportunity to gather prominent high street properties into community ownership, to take back control and put the community in the driving position to turn around the local economy and retain the investment benefits in Dumfries rather than absentee landlords and retailers and offshore investment funds extracting money from the town Well, what should our high street look like? With this in mind, the focus fell upon a stretch of the high street adjacent to the mid steeple, which is a conic building in the centre of the high street, a tall steeple, historic building, where almost all these properties uh, in this central area were either empty or disused and had been for some time. Many had significantly decayed as a result of neglect by absentee owners. The mid steeple quarter site is located next to, as I say, this category A listed building. It's in a conservation area and many of these buildings are actually listed as well. It covers an urban block of the original town with the main building frontages onto the high street. 
So the concept is to revitalize this heart of Dumfries through community ownership and enterprise. So we sought to reimagine this strip of empty buildings on the high street as a community run mixed development of live, work, education, enterprise and social spaces. We pulled together a blueprint, a blueprint document, which was really a vision, ex express the vision in a glossy document, which could be used to explain it to stakeholders, grant fund ap applications and uh, government at different levels. This is the urban block here as exists. Um, it's as the, the Mids Depot is the, the building to the right, so the coloured area is the Mids Depot quarter itself. Um, so it's, it's really the focus of the majority of the vacant empty shops uh, and, and upper buildings. It's also, as I say, the centre of the high street um, with Bank Street, which is the, 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 the street on the, the, the left hand side running uh, to the left, which is um, the, one of the main routes to the high street from the river and the car parking. So it's a key location in the high street and it's considered to be the heart of the town centre. It contains, as I say, a number of listed buildings and historic closes. Although some of these routes have been blocked up over the years by backland development where floor space has often been extended to cover much of the plots. And as I say, many of these properties are in very poor condition. So the master plan vision really is, uh, is, is to bring new life back to this uh, area in a concentrated area in the town centre and in order to stimulate new growth around it um, to, and create confidence in the local economy again. So in 2018, we held an architecture competition um, to provide ideas for that concept, which was won by uh, ADSL Architects, whom we now have an ongoing relationship with and who've helped produce our master plan and design for the, the proposal. Um, this uh, master plan is now approved as planning policy by the local council in their local development plan. And they have a specific policy in the local development plan for Mid Steeple Quarter, which is on the basis of it being a community led regeneration. Uh, the vision, this is a cross section uh, of the vision um, it, of what it might, what the quarter might look like, like with the public facing activity onto the high street on the right hand side there. Flexible multi use activity in the centre, small business and maker spaces on the ground floor with residential housing use on the upper floors. Um, lively closes, lively public open space to open up accessibility creation of co-working spaces, maker spaces, retail, and as I say, affordable, a, a sustainable living accommodation on the upper floors. And this is a, a section really of the ground floor to show the, the scale really we're talking about of enterprise and co-working spaces on the ground floor to create 60 new homes, 50 new commercial spaces, essentially a new neighborhood and community within a sheltered urban block uh, which could potentially be home to in the region of 200 people. To create this vibrant and sustainable quarter, um, the development, the town said development needs to be diverse, adaptable, driven by community needs, aspirations and enterprise, to recognise and respect the environment, to reopen the, the closes and create public spaces and, and residential on upper floors. So this is quite a, an ambitious vision, clearly. And so we've had to break it down into manageable phases. So this is our preliminary phasing plan, uh, which shows phase one at the top there is what we've called the oven, which is the first building we've acquired. Phase two overlaps really with phase three, which phase two is essentially site acquisition. So the green element is the buildings that we've, we're have we also trying to acquire. And phase three is the redevelopment of those. And then further down the line, phase four and five is the acquisition of, of more buildings and redevelopment of them. So phase one, going back to that, really comprises a building, um, 135 High Street, which faces onto the main square in the town. It was a formerly a baker, bakery shop. Let me just go on to that. Phase one, this is the building here, this highlighted there to the right. Um, it was owned by Dumfries Gallery Council and Mid Steeple Quarter took ownership of that building as a, under a community asset transfer, which was agreed in November 2018. The upper floors are essentially derelict, 
on the ground floor of the building, we've been using it for community pop-up shops and exhibitions and events. The idea of that being to kind of test the capacity of the market for community groups, how they would use the space and that to, in order to assist our formulation of ideas for future uses of other buildings. We uh, have raised two and a half million pounds through various funding sources to redevelop the building. And uh, we've applied for planning permission and been granted planning permission just in August to redevelop it for um, on, the, on the ground floor, uh, shop and exhibition space on the shop area, um, new shop front. Um, and down the, the, the lane, you can see they're looking down the back of the building, enterprise workshop spaces on the ground floor, uh, co-working space on the first floor, and then seven flats for rent on the upper floors. Um, next, uh, this is a, just some visualizations of the, the, the section really looking down away from the high street and uh, a nighttime vision really of public space that will be created next to that building. Um, this is ownership, where we're at with ownership. So we now actually, the purple buildings are three buildings that we now own. So we took ownership of two more buildings last month, just through negotiation with the owners uh, to buy them. And uh, we're in negotiation, the green ones are, we're in negotiation with the owners of three more buildings. The red ones are owners who have declined to sell to us. However, those ones that the owners don't want to sell, they, 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 they actually have tenants at the moment. So those buildings are actually occupied. So they're not a priority for us to, to acquire at the moment anyway. But here's an example of this is two buildings that we bought uh, just last month. Um, they'd been empty for over a decade, uh, upper floors and ground floors entirely empty and essentially abandoned. And they've changed hands many times, but we managed to acquire them, as I say, last month. Um, we were um, uh, purchased through negotiation with the owners and was funded by South of Scotland Enterprise, which is a local uh, enterprise agency of uh, money from the Scottish government. And we got volunteers involved and, and local artists and businesses to help uh, uh, us re, uh, um, just refresh the shop fronts and the signage uh, just to get to, to so that people could see an immediate change and positive change to the to the buildings and we are going to rent out those ground floor shops on a, a temporary basis um, while we raise funds to redevelop the buildings for the uh, residential and upper floors and enterprise space to the rear. Um, We've got a website which uh, be keen for you to have a look at. There's loads of information on there and lots of um, resources that you can download. Uh, various case studies that have been done on mid steeple Quarter by national um, research bodies and uh, information on our feasibility work and business plans. Um, but uh, the key to all of this really has been community consultation and getting the, uh, the community behind the vision and supporting of it. And then, of course, is working with stakeholders in the parts and Scottish Government, Council, uh, Development Trusts, um, etc., who we've been able to gain expertise from and financial assistance, obviously, as well. So that's my presentation. Thanks for listening. OK, brilliant, Scott. Thanks a million for that. Um, and I know we have a couple of questions. Uh, coming through there first. I love the idea of the down the Dune Tune Army, but I might be giving my uh the Scottish the the best pronunciation there. In terms of getting people involved in the start, like I assume there was a lot of kind of interest in in the start from kind of different community groups and, and organizations. How have you been able to maintain that interest since say 2016 right up up to today? We've, we've had to employ a freelance uh, communications lead um, to deal with all of, the, all of that. Although some of it's been done by volunteers, but the communications lead leads on press releases and social media campaign. Um, and then with the volunteers, we've, we've done continual kind of events 
and public consultation. So we've used the oven building, that space that we acquired um, first. We've used that as a, as a kind of shop window in a sense to what we're doing. We'll invite people in for meetings, for consultation events. We're always asking questions of the, the community, getting their feedback. And that's, that's a kind of cyclical thing that we're constantly doing all the time to get engagement. So it's done physically, it's done uh, also through social media as well. Okay, and we have a question in there from one of our stakeholders. How are you acquiring the buildings? Is it CPO or general purpose? And will phase four and five acquisitions become more expensive as owners see the first phase is happening? This is, this is absolutely right. This is something we we're actually talking about at a meeting this morning. Yeah, it's something we're very aware of. Um, the, we've been a, we would love to be able to acquire them through compulsory purchase, but the council will not help us with that. They have, the compulsory purchase system in, in, in Scotland is so difficult. It would take us probably a decade to, to try and acquire buildings through that process. So the council won't even start the process. Uh, they think it's a waste of time. Um, the other uh, legislation in Scotland which we're trying to use is under the local... Um, the, the Land Reform Act from 2016, which is uh, as part of that, it has uh, what's called community right to buy. So buildings which have been derelict or if there's sustainable uh, um, justifications uh, for community benefit, the, if the community is supportive of that, we can, um, we can go through a process whereby the Scottish government can work with us to acquire the buildings but the problem with that is a number of problems with that. That's the that's legislation that was really framed for, you may have heard of kind of quite well-known cases of Highland parts of Highland estates or islands like the Isle of Gia in the Western Isles, which were purchased by their local community. Um, that was a legislation that was used for that, but it doesn't work so well in an urban environment because you have to get the majority of the population of your what you class as your community to vote in support of it. And that's very difficult to do in, a, in an urban environment. But also it doesn't really give you the right to buy it. All it does is put a, 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 a marker really on the title of the building, which means that the owner can't, if they do want to sell, they have to sell it, give the community the option of purchasing it first. So it doesn't guarantee that uh, the community will end up acquiring it so that's going on in the background we are we are working with the scottish government on community right to buy uh, but um we've we wanted to move quicker than that and um, quite and, and as, as has been pointed out by the by the person asking the question there's a danger that uh, um if we take too long over this the the built the end the value of these buildings increases which will make it even harder for us to acquire them so now particularly with the economic climate at the moment now's the time where really we need to try and buy these buildings because potentially we're at the bottom of the market and these are buildings which were changing hands only 10 years ago for half a million to a million pounds and are now being valued at, at the most of it sort of around about a hundred thousand pounds and the difficulty there is is that particularly where it's maybe a, a fund or a pension fund that owns them they've got those those buildings on an asset balance as a, you know as written down as being worth a lot more than they are in reality so there's a reluctance to 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 release them because there's it's a huge write off involved in that but some of them we have as you say we've we've as i say we've bought a couple of buildings and we have managed to get them at valuation um and we're hope, hopeful of getting in the next couple of months another two at valuation um so yeah that we, we we were trying to move as quickly on site assembly as possible so that we're not caught out by rising values. Yeah, because you'd be raging after spending a million and you guys coming in to offer a hundred thousand, you'd be yeah. kind of you'd be wondering where you or you being done there. And I suppose there there is a question there about the reality uh, of people that do own vacant properties. Like are they living in reality or are they kind of, you know, speculating and, and hoping things things yeah. turn around? We have another question there about monies and finances. Uh, one of our uh, stakeholders has asked, the capital costs for acquisitions and redevelopment must be considerable. Is this coming from a cocktail of funding and is that difficult? And could that make or break the project uh, being fully delivered? Yeah, it, it's, that's a good way of expressing it. It is essentially a cocktail of funding. So it's from no one source. So being a community, a community group, constituted group, we've been able to draw funding from various different routes. So, um, and this is one of the benefits over it being, if it was the council, for example, that was trying to, 
to push pull this together. So we, we've been able to draw funds from the council, from the Scottish government, from enterprise agency, from local charitable trusts, and we've also raised a substantial amount of money from the local community, purely in donations and crowdfunding. And one of the things that we're looking at currently is, is uh, we, were, we were intending, before COVID came along, we were intending to go out this summer to on a, with a community bond offer, which would enable the community to buy bonds that we could essentially borrow against. Um, we were hoping to raise over a million um, for the, from that, but we've put that on hold for now because we just didn't feel with all the economic stress at the moment that it was the right time to go out to the community for that. But that's still something we would tend to do. We're also exploring um, with uh, South of Scotland Enterprise the potential for um, private money and how we could lever private money into it. But the key thing there will be that we want to retain the community's control. Um, how we can leave our private money. There's no easy answer to that yet, but it's something I'm very keen on um, pursuing. Yeah, and I love the idea of like the community bond offer is, you know, asking people to invest in where they live and invest in the future of the town and 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 invest in, I suppose, the future for future generations. So I think that's that's a great idea. Just to let you know, Scott, your broadband just keeps dropping out a little bit, so the sound is going. So uh, just uh, if it does, bear with us, everybody, and uh, we'll make sure he joins back in. But we've a whole stream of questions coming in there for you to answer so you're not getting away on us just yet so we have another question in in constructing the master plan did you consider the impact of not being able to access particular plots absolutely and there is a it's part of that phasing is key to that yes there are certain buildings we need to acquire to allow as for construction access from from public roads so yeah that that is part of um been uh, part of the considerations um, in, in drawing up that master plan. So it, 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 there is a there's a significant benefit in us acquiring a number of buildings to enable us to redevelop. Yeah. Okay, and then following on from that, in the future, will the new homes that you provide, will and a, the new homes and apartments, will they be sold or are they going to be rented to the public or is it a mixture? As things stand at the moment, um, they're for rent because the first phase uh, we want to... Um, really kind of test the market and and we want to and bring in some income from us and, and so create a sustainable business model so for the first phase we we do want it to be for rent um, uh, but going forward we are open to the possibility of 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 sale and um, there is the, the corner building um, on the uh, at the bottom of the high street which we're in the process of of, of purchasing at the moment is kind of self-contained and uh, it, we, we'd just be refurbishing it. We wouldn't be redeveloping it. That one has the possibility, uh, it'd be easier for us to refurbish that and sell those. If we create four apartments in it, we could sell them and that would help us obviously raise capital. Um, so, uh, but the other ones, we're not so keen on the idea of selling off um, apartments above space that we control. We'd rather have control over, over all, but that's not to say there might be some self-contained opportunities that we could sell to raise capital so kind of kind of a mixture depending on on, on on finances you were talking about uh 50 new commercial spaces that's to me listen to you that's a huge amount of commercial spaces is there a demand for that or are you hoping demand builds over time or what's the thinking behind 50 spaces it is over time so there is demand for um for spaces at the moment we have a lot of inquiries it's, 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 it's a strange thing about um commercial property the, these buildings have been sat empty for a long time but then as soon as we purchased two of them before we've even done anything to them we've had a string of inquiries from people wanting to rent space in them which is great uh, but um if, i think it is something that will build over time so 50 is an ambitious target uh, which we, we want to create a new a uh, new quarter here which people will start to get excited about and want to be part of so it will build over time i think it's because you took the pound land signs off a couple of them shops scott that you're getting more interest <laughs> uh, another question here from somebody else is um what organization managed and acted as registrar for the architectural ideas competition it was um uh oh that's i'm trying to that was a few years ago now it was um it was an arch. I can't remember actually. It was an architecture body <laughs> in Glasgow. Yeah, it was. It was. A, it was a body that over uh, that, that oversees ar architects generally. 
in well, look, we'll ask whoever asked that question just to drop it uh, into me in an email and we will let you go back and research that and we'll come back with a proper answer after the that. webinar. OK, we've another more questions are flying in today, Scott, which is great. Have you ever considered accessing community funding or have you have or have you considered the existing community financial infrastructure, i.e. credit unions? Yeah, we have we have briefly considered credit union. There is already a credit union in Dumfries, so we've been kind of we don't want to really set ourselves up in competition with anybody. So that's been a reason why we haven't pursued a credit union. But we are looking at we're looking at all funding opportunities, and uh, there are community funds which we are we are working with. So yeah, that's part of a, a suite the suite of uh, funding opportunities that we're, we're pulling together. And just to kind of from my own point of view, like say conversations that we're having today, you know, going out and talking to different stakeholders, to different organisations in, in different countries. Does that help the agenda of the mid Steeple Core project? Like, is that kind of improving things or is that just kind of uh, part of your job? But if, like, do these conversations help? Yeah, these have helped because um, of, over time it's built a profile for us. So the more people that know about what we're doing here, it's helped raise our profile nationally and internationally. So off the back of that, in the last six months, um, two key UK-wide uh, research papers have included us as case studies. So that was one done by the Carnegie Trust and then one just a couple of weeks ago, which was published, which was um, uh, called Power to Change, which was researched by the London School of Economics. So it was really out of that, particularly that last paper, that we've now got a UK-wide national profile regarded as the first UK community-led regeneration of high street regeneration. Excellent. And I suppose we probably have a lot of people listening today that are the community base who will be interested in setting up something similar. But we'll also have a lot of stakeholders listen to us who would like to support a community in Ireland to do something similar. So. Like we have a range of people listening from, you know, local authorities to approved housing bodies to architects. Is there any kind of advice you'd give to those who, who could support groups like yourselves? Like what do you need from the local authorities? What do you need from government? What do you need from uh, different types of people? Is there like is there a call out to say, like, if you did X, this would be useful for for us? Um. I think the, the key, kind of at the start of the presentation, what I was trying to get across there was the key to actually uh, starting something like this has been about uh, community capacity. So it's getting the community behind a vision and, and getting volunteers involved to, to start things off, to build a critical mass that can take it forward. And it's through doing that we were then able to then apply for funding, which was able to sort of employ our project team uh, to then really take it forward seriously and start acquiring buildings. So there's a, there's a kind of step-by-step -step process that the fundamental start of it really is about the community capacity. So if local authorities or, or the government are able to facilitate communities and give and, and, and help with advice of how to set up, a constitute a community body, how do you govern that? How do you, how do you do community engagement? Those kind of resources would be helpful to community groups who are starting from, from scratch. Um, but then once you get constituted, once you get set up and you've got enough people involved, then it's actually easier then to apply for funding because funders obviously look for constituted bodies. And then once you've got assets as well, it tends to be that funders will take even more seriously. So when you own buildings, they'll take you seriously as well. And with a proven track record, this is why phase one is really important that we get, you know, we're starting that construction in the new year. Once that starts getting built and then it's starting to, you know, in two years time when that's complete and we're actually using that space. Again, we're up another level of how serious stakeholders and, and funders take us because we've proven that we've, as a community, we've acquired and redeveloped buildings and we've got a sustainable business model. And I think that's I think that's important here is 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 what you raise is the idea of a sustainable business model that it's just that it has to be sustainable. It's just not a gang of people getting together to kind of, you know, renovate properties. It's part of a business model. It has to kind of bring in income. It has to be sustainable. It has to be all these different things. So I presume that's really an important part of, of what you're doing in the mid steeple core. 
yeah, the, the financial model is really important. And and I mean, ideally, I, w- I would like there to be much more private money involved in it because it would it would help create a model that would be more transferable to other towns. It can't just be based on public money, but public money is necessary. We found at the start of it to really deal with this market failure issue, uh, to acquire the buildings. Um, but hope, we're hopeful that once we once we've actually got to the redevelopment stage and uh, that we'll be able to attract private money. And you talk about transferability. Obviously, we're very interested over in here in Ireland in what you're doing and uh, we'll, we'll be closely following what's going on. But has there been much interest from other towns in Scotland in terms of what you're doing? Um, have you, has anyone been inspired or are, are people just watching now and letting you make the mistakes and then learning from them? <laughs> There's, there's there's lots of interest we get we get uh, requests to speak on a weekly basis and um the, the scottish government particularly are watching very carefully what we're doing uh to see whether it can be a model that we are um what can be used in other towns and th- there are other towns who are starting to do similar things but they're they're further behind us um in that i mean it's taken us uh, many years, or really sort of five years, really to get to where we're at. Um, um, so it, it does take time, and the, the longest time has been building that community capacity and the community engagement to get the community behind a vision and what is that vision and everybody to support it. Um, so the, the, I think most other towns that are starting to are, are at that stage at the moment, that early yeah. stage. And you have a lot to offer in terms of building community capacity and and just getting people involved and. That just didn't happen overnight because I think we were talking uh, just before or, or yesterday about that kind of slow process of, of building that engagement and, you know, n- not to maybe give up at the start if not everyone buys into your vision, but it, it, it's a slow process. It, it's not an overnight fix to say, oh, we'll come together as a community and, you know, we'll get these properties renovated and we'll create a new quarter. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the artist factor in all of this has been a big plus as well. So the stove with its, its artist-led community uh, development trust doing um, ongoing events and art exhibitions and, and take using environmental and community art as a, a kind of focal point for raising issues and getting reactions from people and, and engagement that's uh, that's been really useful for for Dumfries and how we've got to where we are it's really been built on the back of that and I, I'll, I'll mention the dreaded c word but do you think there'll be an increased demand for people for town centre living um, since people are kind of working from home since COVID or will that impact what you're doing at all, do you think, in terms of, of demand? The sign, the signs that we are seeing is that this, the cities are more affected by that with less people wanting to move uh, into the town or wanting to live there. Generally, there's signs of people wanting because of COVID wanting to move out the town, uh, out cities, sorry. But in, in Dumfries, no, not we haven't seen that so far. In fact, uh, the, the, the signs are the opposite. People, there's been a, in terms of the residential property market in Dumfries, in the last six months, it's been very buoyant. And people are moving, wanting to move to a rural area. So Dumfries is seen as a, it's a rural, it's a rural town. Um, so although it's, uh, we'd be talking about town centre living, okay. it's, on a, it's on a small scale. Uh, and 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 there is definitely a market we're seeing for people who would want to who are maybe self-employed or wanted to start a small business who want to have some kind of space so this is where there's a connection between the residential to rent and the co-working space to rent that people that we're going to link those two so that people could rent an apartment and have a discounted um, uh, um, rent for a co-working space perhaps so they've got a little office that that, that they can share and they can uh, be part of a, a community there that's affordable to them uh, to, 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 to run their own business from. And just a question in terms of, of the, the units you want to provide like will these be just one and two beds are we talking family units Um, have you any desire to attract like older people intergenerational living in, in Dumfries yeah. or or what's the market? Well, the market's quite difficult to pinpoint in Dumfries Town Centre because there essentially isn't really a market at the moment. We're creating a new market. There's very few people live in the town centre and there's very few properties in the town centre that are currently fit for residential use. So it's about creating that market. So as the phase one, um, we have gone on the basis of um, 
two bed, two bed apartments, which are for what we call mid-market rent. So they're just kind of at the higher end of what's classed as affordable. Um, so that's that's really the first phase to see how that goes. But we are very keen on intergenerational housing and we we want to try and create more of a mix as we go forward. But we're, we're, we're still in that kind of, de we're, we're developing our, 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 our really program for the rest of the housing within the rest of the master plan. Once, we, you know, as we, as we move forward with phase one, then I think that will be the, the, the catalyst to see how the rest of it goes. But the board of Mid-Table Quarter are, are very keen on intergenerational housing. And I've visited some intergenerational housing schemes in Europe over the last uh, beginning before before COVID in February um, to, to sort of look at models there that we could that we could potentially uh, learn from. Yeah, excellent, because it'd be great to see kind of an intergenerational community there. We have a planning related question. How have you engaged with the planning system to realise the plan? And no, oh, oh, sorry, is the master plan part of any statutory framework? And are there planning standards which need to be changed to realise this type of project? Yeah, yeah, we have um, the master plan. Uh, we submitted with the timing was good for us because the local development plan for De and Galloway was in its uh, proposed. Uh, it was emerging at the time when we were we were the project and the master plan were emerging. So we submitted representations to that local development plan, and uh, the local planning authority um, included the master plan in their policies. So there is a policy for mid steeple quarter, which specifically sets that kind of policy framework that it can be mixed use, it's about housing, it's community led. And uh, there is a master, the master plan itself has been approved as supplementary planning guidance by the council. So we are part of that policy framework, planning framework. Um, there's no, there's no obvious kind of um, planning tools that I would say need to be reformed to, to enable what we are doing. It's, it's uh, you know, the local authority working with us, um, uh, there, are, there are opportunities to, uh, to, 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 to um, enable what we're trying to do. What, one, one thing that has had to change really is in terms of high streets, is this historical planning policy for high streets, which is based on, on retail being the kind of anchor to your high street and with the changes to retail with the contraction of retail that has been a fundamental and it depends on the scale of of, of the high streets the, what the, the scale of the town but with that contraction that we've seen in Dumfries it's about uh, relaxing that policy to allow other uses so before that policy is relaxed you would have to jump through hoops to be able to justify a use that wasn't class one retail. Um, if, you know, you would have to show that the building had been empty for 12 months, that what you were proposing was going to create footfall um, and some you know, financial issues as well. But we wanted a more relaxed uh, policy so that you could change the use of a shop into, you know, whatever, a community use or an event space or something away from retail uh, which would uh, would be you know would, wouldn't be a very difficult ask for the planning system to to address, and it's because I think it's so important that we see with the contraction of retail that we see different functions, a mixture of different functions for town centres to to create a reason to go there to attract people to use their town centre, and, and come back from this sort of out of town retail time that we've gone through where people get in their cars and drive to the supermarket or the retail park on the outskirts. It's a, creating more reasons to bring people back into the high street. Excellent. Now we've one last question and then we, we'll wrap up and we'll let you go. Uh, oh, well, we've a couple of questions coming in. So if people want to stay with us for another couple of minutes and if you can't, Scott, I'll, I'll try to get through them. Uh, question to do with profits from rents and sales. You've mentioned that profits from any potential sales in initial phases will be used to raise capital for later phases. But what about in the long run once all the phases are complete? Are there plans for rental profits, et cetera, to be invested in further in community development activities? <laughs> that That's going beyond where we've got to really at the moment. We're, we're not looking that far ahead yet. We're looking at a 20 year plan here really. Um, so once we get to the stage, if the, the whole master plan is 
is all built out and is all operating and the rent's coming in. We don't have a plan for beyond that. Apart from one of the one of the ideas we've got at the moment is that we're working on is a, a district heating system based on a, a geothermal uh, based um, heat exchange system. And we are hopeful that that could not only power heat our buildings, but we could potentially sell that to the rest of the town centre. So that that's a kind of ongoing part of our business model that may provide income for the future. But beyond beyond that, no, we're not we're not we haven't got yet got a plan for what happens after we've done what we want to do. Yeah, if you get there, that's living the, that's the dream uh, yeah. already. And then we've one last, and I love the idea of 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 the the district heating, and, and definitely in terms of uh, you know bigger challenges we're facing in terms of, of climate change and energy consumption and and all that. So, so that's fantastic. Final question is uh, somebody has asked, what measures um, are you putting in place to mitigate mitigate against the area becoming hipster or just about hipster culture and ensure that it does it is and to ensure it becomes a sustainable place for people to work and live so I don't know if you have that term in Scotland you might have but you know very trendy so yeah there there is a there is a danger I suppose that gentrification I suppose is the kind of term isn't it um yeah we there is there's a balance there because that we, we do want to attract people to live in the town centre who've got disposable income because we want that to help the economy of the, and revive the town centre, um, but absolutely we want to balance that with it being a, a diverse town centre and having people you know for people the, the, the whole involving the whole community and not just creating one kind of particular type of community. So it is something that the mid Quarter are very aware of, and that, that will feed into our housing policy, um, how, how we, uh, you know, both in terms of uh, the type of housing that we're providing and also the, our housing allocations policy. Brilliant. And one very, very, very last question, and I promise this is the last one, um, and we're getting a lot of comments just uh, about the great work that's going on in Dumfries. The final question is, are there any of the property owners within the scheme or within the area engaging with the community model? So are there property owners that are want to be part of the project or part of the model? Or is it just a case that you're buying out properties from the property owners? No, they're just buying them out. The property owners are not working with us. No, it would be great if they would. Uh, but no, no, so far, no. In fact, what, one of the buildings that don't want to sell to us is a, is a Dublin-based company. Um, and, and you might you might know Bob and Bert's, the co- coffee shop chain. It's a, it's a, it's a Dublin-based coffee shop. They, they're a tenant as well in one of the buildings. And they're, they're members of the Mid-Sipple Quarter, but the, the tenant is, but the actual owner of the building uh, isn't working with us, won't even respond to our, our uh, kind of communications. That's great, Scott. End it on out in Dublin, people. <laughs> That's p- fantastic. Some of our non-Dublin uh, stakeholders will be delighted to hear that. Um, but look, I, we, we'll end it there because I know people have things to do and other places to go. Thanks a million for your time. If anyone has any further questions, uh, please get in contact with myself or, or Scott. We've put the links up to the mid Steeple Port Quarter project there. There's loads of great reading, great documents on that. So uh, thank you for your time um, and thank you for agreeing to participate. And for everyone listening, um, we have another couple of webinars, one next week on mobility, uh, sustainable transport and neighbourhood design and the following week on uh, the German Sustainable Building Standards. So thanks all for listening and we'll talk to you